Well, hey everyone, tuning in from home. My name is Antonio Lopez and I'm with Soundbridge Music. We are a nonprofit incorporated in 2017 based out of Longmont, Colorado. And we were founded as a grassroots effort to use the power of music to make a positive difference in communities across the Front Range. Today we have with us Clay Rose, front man from the Colorado band, the Gasoline Lollipops. He is our featured artist for the month of September. Uh, the Gasoline Lollipops released a new album called All the Misery Money Can Buy earlier this month. The album release show at Red Rocks marked the first time a rock band has played the Morrison Venues outdoor stage in front of a live audience since the coronavirus pandemic arrived in March. Clay, welcome. Thanks for taking the time to talk with me today, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, Antonio. The beautiful sunset you got going on there behind you, man. Yeah, it's uh, fixing to be dark, so <laughs> enjoy the view while it lasts, and then I'll be a silhouette. Yeah, it's That's amazing cool. like how much uh, daylight we're losing each day this time. I know, it's crazy. I really actually appreciate it. Uh, the summer was so intense, you know, and I'm like, I'm looking forward to quieter, quieter times, longer nights, shorter days. I'm all right with that. Yeah, I feel like the fall is like my favorite time of year. Yeah, I can feel myself starting to go into like hibernation mode, you know. Is that, is that kind of what you like, like fall, winter? Like that? Yeah, fall and winter, man. I, I never thought that I would be that way, you know, because when I was a teenager, I just lived for spring and summer, but it's flipped on me now. Uh, I, well, I enjoy both, but more and more, yeah, I like, you know, fall and winter are more introverted. It's a time for creating and writing and recording. And then the spring and summer is just get out and go, uh, release records, play, tour, and, uh, and it has its own appeal. But as I get older, I don't know, I'm finding myself, uh, kind of contracting back into myself you know totally yeah i feel that too and i have a similar experience with what's my favorite season as i grow older and older and uh so earlier before we went live on facebook we were chatting a little bit and we were talking about when the two of us met each other and it was it's hard to believe it was only earlier this year but it was yeah, back, no. that seems like such a long time ago, right? like January 2020. That's like a yeah. completely different era. But yeah. uh, at the Folk Alliance International Conference out in Kansas City, or it was at New Orleans this year. Yeah, New Orleans. And uh, I was helping out, just kind of checking people in. And it's hard to, meet Clay, hard to miss Clay Rose, because how tall are you, man? I'm 6'4". Yeah, yeah, they just came through the line. And you were kind of with a contingent of other Colorado people, so we – got to chatting a little bit about mutual fans and kind of our new album projects that each of us were working on and you guys were like when you were there in New Orleans you were wrapping up the new record right yeah we we recorded at Dockside Studio in Lafayette Louisiana so after Folk Alliance we went back there uh, for our second rounds to do overdubs and some mixing and yeah we wrapped up the album that that month, which was pretty I fortuitous. The projects that each of us were working on. Everything went locked down after that. Yeah. So why did you choose there to work on your record and not somewhere out here? Uh, well, there was a bunch of reasons, but one of them was um, that we really wanted to get that sort of late 60s, early 70s Muscle Shoals sound on the record. And it was really important to us that we record on tape and not digitally. And there's, uh, so that kind of limits uh, the situation as far as available studios go, because a lot of studios have a tape machine, but they still put it into Pro Tools either before or after tape. And we didn't want it to ever hit Pro Tools. We wanted it mixed on tape, mastered on tape. Um, so that limited our options a bit, but we definitely wanted to be down south. Another reason we wanted to be down south is because the album is political in nature. Um, and we wanted to hopefully kind of open up a dialogue with uh, south of the Manson Nixon line, as it were, uh, just to 
because I feel this divide. I think we all feel this divide getting bigger and bigger between the left and the right, between the blue and the red. And, uh, and I don't really see it. Um, I don't really see the problem as being on one or the other side of party lines. I see it being more of a financial problem, right? And the disparity of wealth. And I feel like there are just as many, if not more, poor people on the red side of the line or on the right side of the line. Um, and so I want to I want to open a dialogue with my with my fellow poor Americans, right? Whether they're Republican or Democrat, and uh, sort of suss out that we got a lot more in common than we do in differences, and that we both have a common enemy, um, which is capitalistic greed, you know, and if we can open a dialogue and recognize who the oppressor is, you know, it's not the Democrats, it's not the Republicans, it's not the conservatives, it's not the liberals, it's the dudes making hundreds of thousands of dollars a day off the sweat and blood of the working class. That's the oppressor. I don't care if they're a Democrat or a Republican, that's who's holding us down. So uh, it was important to me to open up a dialogue with um, people in the South because people in the South tend to be, you know, the working class and the underpaid tend to be Republican down there. And I wanted to find out why, and I wanted to talk about it. Cool, man, that's, that sounds like you really have a lot of meaning behind this record. It's not just some sound with some words on it, you know, you're something that's really coming from your heart, something that's really coming from what you believe in. And Man, like what you're talking about is totally stuff I believe in. It's really sad how the people in power have used like divide and conquer, like one of those oldest tricks in the book, you know? Totally. They tell us all these reasons why why I'm different from you and you're different from me and why we shouldn't like each other. And it's like, you know what, man? Me and you got we got way more common with each other than with those guys, you know. And we we're uh watching out for each other more than they are. They don't give a shit about us, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, they'll use, they'll use political affiliation or they'll use culture or the color of somebody's skin or what their last name is or who they pray to and say, oh, that's the enemy. That's who's holding you down, you know? And unfortunately, there are enough people who are ignorant enough to, uh, to swallow the pill without researching what they're taking right and uh and nowadays it's getting harder and harder to, to even do research right because uh the way the internet's set up to just follow people's algorithms and carry them down rabbit holes is disconcerting you know so yeah. that's why i think uh it's really important to just meet face to face and talk about real life experience what's it like for you out there you know and uh, and just get human again, you know. Stop, stop using all of these. I don't know, all these technological middlemen to uh, translate our feelings and thoughts and, and sit down face to face. That's why I'm pretty bummed about the uh, the tour schedule getting wiped out, you know, because I was really looking forward to actually going on tour down through the south that's one of the places we're going to tour is down through new orleans and atlanta and nashville um dallas and and have conversations with these people about these songs so kind yeah. of bummed that that didn't get to happen yeah man that's, that's a shame i'm sorry that we weren't able to do that for this new record and it's a, it's a weird time in so many different ways so first and foremost thank you for making music through this and releasing new music through this because uh, i think it's really relevant to the times we're living in, you know, and maybe even when you guys track the record, you guys didn't know that this pandemic was going to come down, but it's like what you're talking about in the record is even more relevant and more pressing now. Yeah. So thanks for uh, not being quiet about all, everything that's going on, you know, and using your artistic platform to speak up. And Yeah, there's a time and a place for it, you know, and, and before the pandemic hit, I mean, it was like, there was already a, a national crisis going yeah. on, which is Donald Trump. Um, and that had been going on for a few years at that point. So I felt like it was definitely the time and place 
to use the platform and use the microphone um, in a in a way that was socially and politically conscious. You know, I don't always feel that I need to put out records like that and sing like that. You know, um, sometimes, sometimes like I don't know, maybe real soon here. Uh, all this stuff is so in our faces, right? It's like, <laughs> we're just, you can't open a laptop or an iPhone or turn on the TV without just being barraged by political outrage. And uh, so it might be that soon it's time for uh, an escape record, right? right? One that reminds us of the good old days and is full of love songs and, uh, and, and fantasy. But right now, uh, this is the record we got. And I think that it's relevant because I think that uh, right now is the time for action and that people need to be standing up. And hopefully this record can give people courage to do that. Cool, man. So how do you feel about sharing a song from the new record right now? Oh, to play something? Yeah, is uh, that, is that yeah. cool? Yeah. All right. Let me tune up a little bit. Yeah, so for those of you just here, we got with us Clay Rose, the man of the Gasoline Wall, the Colorado band. Just had a new album about a few weeks ago, released it at a show at Red Rocks, and here shortly he's going to be playing some music off the new record. What you got for us, Clay? Uh, this song is called Dying Young. Right on. Man. When I went to sleep, I was eight years old. Snow was on the peaks. It was late in July, and the ice was coming down on the green. Starlight shine through the pines and cats. Shadows on my bed. I woke up. 20 years later with a shadow on my soul instead now the stars fall just like cannonball the rain comes warm and calm just like they fall but uh, the memory This is she's old, but I know she's dying young. Does it shine eternally? Or is this all we got? Do we have a shot at breaking free? Before the storm oh, Just I can hold The rain becomes warm and calm just like they fall but of the memories of everything we've done oh, they say she's old but I know she's dying
Nice man. So that song as well as a lot of the other ones on the new album, they like seem like they come from real specific places, like inspired by specific people or specific events. So is that true about that song? Like tell us a little bit about the backstory on that one. Yeah, so that song is about uh, climate change, actually. Um, talking about Mother Earth, right? I know she's, they say she's old, but I know that she's dying young and mm. thinking about burning up the memories of everything we've done. And uh, the second verse in there is uh, a lullaby that I wrote for my son, actually, when he was born. And um, so, yeah, the basic sentiment of the song is how do we, how do we pass this world on to our children? What explanation do we give as we pass the baton, right? Uh, it's not easy. It's not easy if we're gonna be honest, you know? <laughs> so um, it's like that, it's basically, a song of apology yeah um and and remembering what the world looked like when i was a kid you know like global warming has happened fast mm -hmm. when i was a kid those mountains behind me were snow peaked all year all year the like long's peak was never not white mm -hmm. when i was a kid and i it wasn't until i was probably like 13 or 14 the first time i saw it without snow on it and now it's like by june it's gone right it's got yeah. no snow on it and year after year after year it's like that so things are changing i don't need a scientist to tell me yeah wow so man that's a powerful thing about music you know here i was thinking it was about like one person like a specific event in one person's life but uh man being it's about climate change and in some ways the death of our world like it's heavy yeah. stuff man and uh yeah thanks for writing music like that uh, yeah, absolutely. and uh that's the second song off the new record and like especially on that one I, earlier you were talking about how you wanted to do this album on tape and you wanted to go down to louisiana to record kind of uh was it in louisiana or alabama that you recorded. Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, because yeah. yeah. I remember you were saying you kind of were going for like that Muscle Shoals, like yeah. vibe, that vintage vibe, and you guys definitely achieved that, man. Cool. Thank you. So, and not knowing that you guys had recorded it on tape, I just immediately it transported me to like that a new take on that old sound, you know. So yeah. kind of like uh, best of both worlds. So. I was watching the live stream that you guys did last night with gasoline lollipops down at Mighty Fine Productions. Yeah. And uh, you guys sounded really tight, man. Like oh, that was, thanks. That was like an amazing sound. It was like literally like studio album quality live stream. Oh, cool. <laughs> so uh, can you just take a moment to kind of talk about each of your bandmates and shine a light on them and just kind of talk about how the collective of all of you came together? Yeah, it was uh, very much by happenstance. So back in the day, Gasoline Lollipops was a very different band. You know, it was uh, mm -hmm. it was much more loose, and uh, I'd say um, much more influenced by like uh, I used to call it like Gothic Appalachian is what I called the gas pop sound. Uh, before that, I called it Punkabilly. Right. And uh, so uh, it was just rougher. And then we got Don Ambory in the band. And Don Ambory is our lead guitar player. And uh, I often say, because I've been sober for going on five years now, and I often say that 
uh, two things that I'm really grateful to alcohol for is my wife and Don Ambury, because I never would have had the courage to approach either one of them if I hadn't been drunk. <laughs> because they're both way out of my league. Um, but Don Ambory was playing a gig up at Gold Hill Inn with Todd Edelman. And apparently I was, I think I was blacked out drunk because I don't remember ask, inviting him to come sit in with the gas pops the next week yeah. where he came. And he sat in and he's, he's played with us ever since. Um, but he had just moved to town not too long before that from Chicago. Um, and he went to music school uh, down in Texas. Um, and so he has a degree in music and he's just a killer guitar player, you know. Uh, then very shortly after that, well, not too shortly, a few years, I guess, uh, Bad Brad Morse moved to town from Florida and he had just graduated music school down there. Um, so he had a degree, but he was uh, more into uh, classical and jazz. So he played like in an orchestra and he played a bunch of jazz, but he had never played rock and roll. He had never played country. Um, and so there was a bit of a learning curve for him, which you wouldn't think. You'd think, oh, well, rock and roll and country, it's simple, you know. And it is in one sense, but in another sense, uh, you know, it's all about feel. It's all about mm -hmm. feel and like where you put the notes. It's not about the notes you play. It's about where you play them. Um, and he caught on pretty quick. He joined the band right before we put out the record Death. And uh, he went on the Death tour with us. That was 2014, mm -hmm. I believe. And then, um, and then we didn't get Kevin. Uh, the drummer until two years ago and uh, he also has a degree in music and he's from Denver though um, and also he's played much more well before us recently he was playing a lot of jazz but before that he was in into hardcore when he was a teenager he was in a hardcore and punk so he he at least knew where I was coming from in, in one regard and then Scott Coulter, our keyboardist, uh, me and him have been friends since we were five years old. We were like in the first grade together and went to elementary school. And then he moved out to Philly uh, a long time ago and he graduated from music school um, as well. So everybody in the band has a music degree except for me. And uh, I, I still don't know how to play my instrument, but they, they tolerate me. <laughs> Nice, man. So, uh, yeah, I lost my train of thought for a second. But, oh, yeah, I was reading about your experiences at Naropa. Yeah. Well, we we'll kind of want to talk a little bit about Naropa University because Shogyam uh, Trumpa Rinpoche, who, like, started uh, Naropa. Like, he was a teacher of a really close friend of mine. Like, she moved to Boulder like back in like the late seventies to study with Trumpa. And she was a quadriplegic lady. Her name was Tetsuku of Cold Mountain. And I grew up down in Southern Colorado down in the San Luis Valley. And she had lived in Boulder for the longest time but had moved down to the valley. And uh, you know, the way I met her was, I was like uh, last week of school sophomore year in college, I was looking for a summer job and looked in the classified section. And it was like a quadriplegic artist looking for a caregiver. And, you know, looking for a summer job and long story short, it like turned into like one of the more meaningful uh, friendships of my life. And, you know, growing up in a small town, I knew nothing of Buddhism, but she kind of taught me a little bit about just like uh, the teachings and the ways of treating people and just ways of being in the world. So yeah, man, just talk a little about a little bit about Naropa and what you were doing there. Uh, well, actually, I was. I guess I went to Naropa probably because my dad went to Naropa. Gotcha. And 
my dad graduated from there. Uh, he was also a student of Chogyam Trumpa. Um, so, uh, he, I think he started studying with Chogyam in like 72. And so he moved out to Boulder to be close to him. And so I was raised in the Shambhala community. Um, and I was going to school at Front Range and then I finished there. I did all the credits I could do there. And then, uh, yeah, I, I, for a minute there, um, this is back when I was sober my first time. I was sober from the time I was 22 till I was 29. And I wanted to do music therapy and wilderness therapy. So I was going to school there. Uh, double major in psychology and music. Um, and then I relapsed. <laughs> and so no more school, no more music, no more psychology. And uh, that relapse lasted seven years. So, um, and also there was a, you know, a realization at one point where I was like, oh, if I get a degree, if I get a master's degree, in either wilderness therapy or music therapy, I'm gonna spend the next 30 years of my life trying to pay off this education. <laughs> then it just did not, I couldn't work it out in my head to make it make sense. And especially when I found out that, um, that I could actually get into those fields uh, just through interning and experience, you know? And there was other ways to get into the field without having a degree. And granted, I wouldn't get paid as much, but I also don't have to spend half my paycheck paying off my student loan, so it kind of evens out. Totally, yeah. It seems like it was a smart move for you and the right move for you. Yeah, I feel like it. And also, you know, if I had stuck with it, there'd be no gas pops, there'd be no widow's bane. Like, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have had time for all that, you know? Totally, yeah. Just a no, different, yeah. totally different life trajectory. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, speaking of like the Widow's Bane and before we went live here, we were talking a little bit about your collaboration with the Wonderbound Dance Company. But it seems yeah. like you, you've kind of got a lot of tentacles reaching out into different uh, creative outlets besides the gas pops. So if you just want to talk a little bit about those things. Yeah. Um, well, the Widow's Bane is a zombie pirate polka band. Uh, <laughs> that I that I started um, back when uh, my wife and I were having some marital problems, and so I started it as a a therapy um, to be able to say whatever I needed to say behind the guise of an alter ego mm -hmm. who was a, you know a 17th century zombie who had been put to death by his wife and resurrected by the devil to sing all about uh, his grievances with the other sex. So that's why I started that band. And, um, and it just took on a life of its own. And uh, as you said, Wonderbound Ballet Company in Denver uh, hired us a couple years ago to write a Halloween ballet for them. And it's based on, uh, it's based on a Widow's Bane song called Old Bayou they named the ballet Wicked Bayou. And strangely enough, it also takes place down in uh, Louisiana. Yeah. And uh, yeah, this October, we are doing a reprise of that ballet at the Parker Pace Center uh, down in Parker, Colorado. And it's going to run for two weekends. And if it's not sold out, it's almost sold out. And last time I checked, there was very few tickets left, but um, cause they're, you know, again, it's limited seating cause of COVID. So yeah. only, only 175 tickets per show. Yeah. So, uh, the Widow's Bane, Wonderbound, Ballet Company. I know you, the guest box, you guys were doing some stuff like down in Belize. Is that correct? Yeah, we were. And we did yeah. like, uh, we did four years in a row down in Belize wow. every January. It was Gas Pops in Belize. And um, unfortunately this year, because of COVID, mm -hmm. it's not possible. And actually our friends down there 
um, who put on the show every year and fly us down there and they're yeah. awesome, but they've been, they've been shuttered. Their business has been shuttered since March and they're having a really hard time. I actually, if anybody uh, is feeling generous and wants to help out their employees have been out of work, you know, it's only tourism down there in Belize and they're on a little Island and without mm -hmm. tourism, there's just no way to make money at all. So these people are literally hungry. Like they can't get fed. Wow. And so there's a GoFundMe uh, that I shared on my personal page and on the Gas Pops page today uh, for the employees of the of the dive bar down in San Pedro. And yeah, they're really trying to figure out how to feed their families. So it's bad. Wow. Well, yeah, it's kind of puts everything in perspective. Huh? It's yeah, like we're, it does. we're like sad about some canceled gigs. Totally. People who don't have no right. people. Yeah, and also I can bitch all I want about our government, right? But at the same time, like, they hooked us up with unemployment. They hooked us up with stimulus checks. And, like, nobody's starving to death because of this. But mm -hmm. down in Belize, this is a different story. I'm going wow. to I'm gonna try to turn on my flashlight. Oh, there you go. Wow, man. There you go. Play real quick, buddy. Oh, okay, there we go. Hey, man. <laughs> yeah, dude, you, you've been uh doing like a pretty good job of live streaming pretty consistently through the last like six yeah. months yeah yeah every sunday i do a live stream sundays at seven um that's been going good yeah i mean it's not you know nothing replaces a packed sweaty bar full of people like i miss that real bad but at least i get to connect with people in whatever way that I can and, and keep the music alive. Cool, man. So speaking of keeping the music alive, how about you share another song with us? All right. for punk rock, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's see. Um, well, we were just talking about the Widow's Bane, so I might do uh, Old Bayou. There's a mad puppet team Coiling in the swamp, in a shack made of human bones, and the puppets that he haunts. Sing like crucifixions from that brain thread, but unlike the saint, these ones aren't dead. Sweet food. Mm -hmm. 
severed the soul from the flesh lost my child no don't get lost my child man i feel like this is one song that maybe like the lo-fi sound of zoom audio like yeah. actually enhanced it in a way oh, so nice. kind of gave it like an eerie feeling and yeah, like the the behind you it was kind of like it got a little spooky man i'm like saying oh, nice. by myself and i'm like started getting a little scared there <laughs> <laughs> so nice. then you were saying that that song that uh wonderbound based the whole ballet off that song? Yeah, well, actually, uh, me and my son, Cohen, who yeah. was, at the time, he was six, I think. And then uh, the director of Wonderbound, the three of us wrote the story together based on the story of that song, yeah. Wow. So then, is that the, the same play this or ballet that's going to take place at the pay center this fall yeah yeah so it's it's a widow's bane thing so the widow's bane is live on stage mortimer leach and all his grandiose perversity will be there nice man and remind people the dates on those uh it's the 16th through the 22nd yeah, so tickets are that are almost sold out. So for- yeah, they're almost sold out. But if you go to wonderbound.com, you can find tickets. Or I think it might be at yeah there or at the Pace Center's website, Parker cool. Pace Center. Nice. So uh, yeah, man. Once again, I want to take thank you for taking the time to talk with me. Absolutely. And before we uh, sign off for the night, is there anything more you want to share with people? Uh, I'm not wearing any pants. That's good, man. I, I'm wearing jogging pants. Because before <laughs> we did the interview, I was like, I better go for a quick job, jog. I've been eating too much quarantine food. You know, I need to get a little exercise at least. These Zoom <laughs> meetings really have some perks, you know. <laughs>